Thanks for tuning in, everyone. Um, I'm here with James Hart from 18 Visions today. How are you doing, man? Good, man. How are you? Yeah, you know, well, as much as you can be in, <laughs> in lockdown. Um, so yeah, just on that, on that topic, um, you know, the topic of, of the year, basically. Um, how are you coping with lockdown? Are your family safe? Everyone okay? Yeah, everybody's good. It's just a uh, weird, weird time for everybody. My wife is a teacher, so... Yeah, you know, she had to finish uh, the school year with distance learning model, uh, everything done through Zoom, which was super weird. Yeah, and then she had to start the year on Zoom, and now she's back in the classroom in a, a hybrid model, which is still kind of weird, but better for her. And then, you know, for me, just finally back to work consistently in the salon. Yeah, I suppose it's obviously quite reassuring then to get obviously that that you've got the work, you've got the money coming in and stuff like that. Cause it's, you know, it's a scary time for, for everyone. Yeah, most definitely. I, I think out of all this, I look and I'm thankful. I do not rely on music or my band for yeah. an income anymore. Yeah. Cause you know, especially like the music industry has been hit heavy cause you know, no one's touring. Nope. It's a weird time to put out an album anyway. Cause obviously even though you can obviously order it all online, you can't go to a store and buy a record and stuff like that. Sure. But, sure. You know, um, and, and speaking of new music, you dropped your new EP, uh, Inferno, uh, just over a week, is it a week ago? I think about, yeah, week, yeah. yeah, about, yeah. Yeah. Uh, how have you been finding the fans have been taken to it? Yeah, I think everybody's pretty, uh, excited about it. I think they're just for the most part excited that we are doing new music again. Um, yeah. you know, it's been over three years since, you know, we came back and, and put new music out and, in the meantime, we've done a couple of reissues of like old releases, uh, 2000, 2001, I think, or 2000 until the ink runs out. We did a, a vinyl reissue and then yep. we just self-released a, a vanity vinyl reissue a few months ago. And the response has been good, but people kind of wanting, you know, new music, which is exciting for us that they're, they're not just hanging on, you know, 18 visions of old that they, you know, they do want something new from us. And the feedback's been, been really, really positive so far. Um, so we're, we're excited about that, you know, for the most part for us, it's just, you know, we want to make music that we enjoy making. So if the yeah. fans can, you know, get behind it, then that's, you know, an added bonus for us. Absolutely. Um, so when did Inferno start coming together? Was that something you recorded? before COVID hit us or were you doing that during, during lockdown or how did that? Do? Yeah. So it, yeah, we actually started work on this, um, gosh, last, last year, maybe. Okay. So it was way before COVID we had planned on doing, you know, a six song EP and we had the music for it, the material for it. And we were just trying to figure out, I think when to release it. Um, as far as like the production went, uh, Keith, our guitar player, he engineered, produced, mixed, and mastered all of it. Oh, wow. And I would say that part of the holdup, the post-production stuff than anything else. Like the songs had been written for a while and I went in and recorded vocals. And from there, he started tinkering with mixes and trying to get the songs to a point where he felt, you know, really, really good about it. And through that, we found ourselves maybe re-recording re re or retracting some vocals, maybe re-recording some guitar parts, maybe adding some little nuances here and there until the songs kind of, you know, started to, you know, become whole. Um, you know, had we released the songs as is when we first kind of went in and, and recorded them, yeah you you know for the most part they'd be the same but you'd get like a, a little bit different of flavor on some of the guitar parts some of the drums and i think a lot of the vocals so you know it's different when you know you're a band rehearsing these songs live you kind of get to work through and see what feels good in a live setting and you know for me how i'm singing it but when i go straight into the studio with something i don't get that time you know in the rehearsal studio to work through it so i'm just yeah. you know laying down my vocals on first instinct and you know kind of having to go back and forth and you know i like this take i like that i can do this better this needs to be a little bit more you know aggressive i need to dial this down a little bit so you kind of find you know um where you're at with the songs over the course of time and because we're we're, we're producing the record ourselves 
we have the luxury of time. So there's really no rush for us to put a product out so we can, you know, work and tinker with parts and, and the mixing and mastering until we're completely settled with it. Yeah. You you were saying as well, but just then like, you know, it's, this basically was a DIY project for you guys. Um, yeah. I know your last album, you know, the, 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 the comeback album, um, you went with Rise Records for that. Um, are you, are you like completely labelless now? You're not, you're not with Rise in any way or anything like that? Yeah. So we're 100% self-funded now. Um, total DIY. And I think that we're, we're just going to, we're just going to keep it that way. It, it's, it's a good model for us. It, it works best for us. Um, you know, we're behind the physical product too now, the merchandise, the vinyl, like everything is just like we have, we're so hands on with it. And I think that that's exciting for us rather than just, you know, record the music and ship it off to the label. Keith does the graphic works and ship, ships it off to the label. And then they put out the product and handle the marketing and all that stuff. Like, yeah, we're, we're not really doing much marketing. It's just, you know, whatever we're doing through our social media outlets and, you know, just kind of pushing the product ourselves. We're not really out there in 2020 to try to gain new fans. We kind of like where we're at. Um, if new fans want to come on board, you know, of course, welcome, but you know, we're just, uh, in a spot where this is purely just for fun for us. So, yeah. you know, we don't have, uh, any stresses or, you know, labors of a major label to worry about expectations. Everything is just pure, like raw fun for us. And I think that's the most exciting, exciting part about it. It's super pure for us. Yeah. Yeah. And I imagine it's like really freeing as well. Like you say, you don't have to go to a schedule. You don't have to appease anyone for a sound or a style or anything like that. You basically yep. do it all on your own terms. So, yeah, it's great. It's yeah. great. Uh, all of it, the, the, you know, the, the, the live aspect of it, the touring or playing shows, everything is just, you know, whenever we can do it, you know, whenever it makes sense for us and, you know, just, it, it keeps things enjoyable, really. Awesome. Um, I know the, the EP as well is a, like a concept record as well, um, based on a, a poem called The Divine Comedy. Yeah. Um, when did the idea of like going with a concept come together for, the, for this EP like and how did you find writing within the confines of a of a concept yeah so we had written um we had written two songs and then Keith had kind of come up with the idea for this concept and uh a lot of it kind of circled around um just some like reading that he was doing on his own right and I thought it was a super cool idea and lyrically the first two songs that we had written had conceptually kind of fit the mold of um, Inferno, right? The, the, like the, the first series. Um, And from there, I just started to, you know, write lyrics um, around the concept and kind of putting myself in inferno in place of dante himself and kind of what i would see or what i would encounter um if i was in that spot and if i was walking through inferno um being led by virgil and taking different people and different real life things that have happened and seeing those sinners and through the different circles of hell that they're in. And yeah, I just thought that that would be something interesting. I've never written for a concept before. And yeah, I found it kind of, uh, I I found it challenging, but also I I found it like absolutely like rewarding lyrically. And it's, it's some of my favorite lyrics I've ever, ever written. Awesome. I mean, did you find any kind of like ties with the, the themes and the lyrics you're writing with some personal experiences as well? So you could kind of like interweave them at all? Or? Uh, yeah. So for me, um, you know, the journey and seeing like the different levels of, of hell and like the different sinners and where they all are. Um, one song I took was uh, The Wicked, which I had actually started writing about a Netflix documentary called The Keepers. Oh, okay. And for those who aren't familiar, it's about um, 
a Catholic nun that was murdered uh, allegedly by, you know, the Catholic church because she had found out and uncovered, um, you know, sexual misconduct within the church in, I believe it was Baltimore, Maryland. Right. Uh, in I think like the 1960s. And it was just this whole world of scandal that I'm sure like you know, most people are privy to nowadays that, you know, kind of goes on behind the scenes there. And I, I, you know, I, I felt like, um, I felt like that was something where if I was on a journey through hell, where I would see these sinners and just kind of discussing what their sins were. Right. So yeah, something like that, where, you know, I can take something that has happened and you know, something that impacted me and, you know, place it within the song setting. Awesome. Um, and we kind of touched on it earlier as well, you know, this, this is like your, so your second release since you guys kind of came back in, in 2017. Um, back when you guys, you know, did reform, um, what was the initial feeling you had? Was there any like concerns as to how it would be received? Like, you know, if the, if the fans would be elated, if, if you, you wouldn't get as, you know, many people kind of wanting to know what you guys are doing as you maybe perceived you might. Yeah. So again, to kind of, you know, circle back to this just being fun for us, that's really, that's really all we wanted. So, and to be honest with you, 18 visions coming back together was kind of a fluke. Um, Keith had approached me in 2016 about working on some music and for those that don't know, which most people don't, 18 Visions was very close to reforming in 2012 and again in 2014. Musically, we just weren't able to get the contributions from everybody that we were looking for, right. that me and Keith were looking for. And we didn't want to go and write 10 songs by ourselves and not really have the other members contributing. And then in 2000, I think it was 2013, our bass player Mick had passed away. And we just felt like it just was something that we probably shouldn't pursue. So right. fast forward to 2016, a couple years later, you know, Keith approaches me about finishing some songs that we were working on for 18 visions um, in 2012 and 2014. And so I, I wasn't working on anything. I had just left my, my other band burn halo. I had kind of put that behind me. And so working on new music was absolutely something I was, I was into. Mm-hmm. We sat down and we started writing and I, I I had kind of approached him about maybe asking Trevor and Ken if they wanted to be involved. So we asked them, Trevor said, yes, Ken, unfortunately didn't have the time to commit. So the three of us just went into the studio. We started, you know, writing some music and started recording and it was just going to be a, a band, the three of us, right. With maybe another guitar player, maybe a bass player. We didn't really know what we were going to do yeah. um, that far out. It was just kind of like, let's, let's, uh, let's hash through the songs and, and get some music together and, and go from there. And then one night I talked to Keith and was like, Hey, you know, you're going to want to play some shows, right? Well, yes, I'm going to want to play shows. Are you going to want to play 18 vision songs? Yes, of course. I'm going to want to play 18 vision songs. I was like, all right, well, you know, my thoughts are, this sounds like an 18 visions album. Keith says, yes, of course you're right. It does. All right. Well, we're only fooling ourselves to not call us 18 visions. We're going to play shows. We're going to play 18 vision songs. Right. It sounds like an 18 visions album. It's your guitar. It's my voice. Like, you know, I know Ken doesn't want to be involved or can't be involved. Let's ask him, you know, how he feels about us moving forward without him. So, you know, we approached Ken and Ken was like, yeah, sure. You know, go for it. So that's when 18 visions was, I guess, officially reformed. Right. So with that in mind, we had, we had said, all right, well, I don't want, you know, these lofty expectations of having to go out and tour and sell a ton of records and, you know, kind of be disappointed by, you know, what may or may not, you know, come of it. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, you know, I don't really want a tour, you know, I don't, I, I can't go out for weeks at a time or months at a time. I can do, you know, a handful of shows here, a handful of shows there. Really, I just want to have fun with it. I'm not, you know, have my own career, not out trying to make a ton of money. Nobody was, 
you know, trying to do that. It wasn't the focal point. So it was just like, Hey, no expectations. Let's just have fun with it. If it's not fun anymore, we won't do it. And so that's, you know, where we are in, in, in 2020. Right. So it's we're still, still, go, still go fun, still fun, still fresh for us. That's the main thing. Cause you know, as soon as it becomes boring, that's when you, when you stop, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so with what you were saying, was there a point if you had, you know, you had these records, well, sorry, these songs, was there a potential of you to go out as a different name? Because like you say, you wanted to speak about, you know, make sure everyone is all okay with it going ahead. And yeah, it sounds like 18 Vision songs, but do you want to go ahead and say it's an 18 Visions record? Was that, was that considered at all? Uh, like a different band name? Yeah, yeah. Or yeah. different project and stuff like that, yeah. Yeah, it was just, uh, like I said, it just started out as a project, me and Keith, and then when Trevor was in and Ken was out, it was kind of like, all right, well, it's not going to be 18 Visions. We'll yeah. come up with a name later. Let's just write the music. Yeah. And the more songs we started compiling, the more and more it sounded like an 18 Visions album. So yeah. it was just, it, 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 only, it only made sense. Yeah, it you know? just came together that way. And yeah. Here you are today. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so before the um, before you went on hiatus, you know, several years before that, um, you know, you, you released the self-titled album, which against the other records sounds like you know it kind of sticks out against the other eighteen visions albums. Um, and obviously, you're on a major label and stuff like that. And from what I read, there were some like I want to say conflicts, like with the some videos and stuff like that. Um, how do you kind of feel about that record now? And what was your take at that time of, you know, all that going on and being on a major label? Yeah. So I think when we were upstream to Epic and Sony, um, we felt like the band was going to enter this new, new journey, right? This like new part, this, this new like chapter of 18 visions where, you know, we were going to be doing bigger things, bigger touring, um, larger scale, uh, big radio pushes, and it just didn't happen. You know, right. we got a we got we got a couple of really big tours, but you know, the label dropped the ball when it came to marketing the band properly. Right. So you know, they pushed the wrong single first, which was the big problem, and then when they tried to recover and push the, the proper single, you know, it was already very late in the quarter of the year. Right. And when the second quarter roll around, they were doing their budgeting and they're just like, Hey, we already spent a ton of money on this band and yeah, we're, we're not going to, you know, we're not going to do anything else. So they, you know, we got dropped and, you know, it was a, a very humbling feeling for us and ultimately kind of led to the end of the band. I think, we were really kind of burnt out on touring and, you know, going through the whole process of, of writing that album and recording it and just where the band was and, you know, the constant influx of like new fans and losing old fans based on musical shifts from album to album that it was like, you know, we kind of felt like, Hey, if we're going to do this, another album, it's kind of like starting from scratch. Well, where do we go? You know? Yeah. And I think everybody just was feeling like the band had kind of run its course at that time. And as far as like writing and recording that album musically, like I have zero regrets and, um, you know, I absolutely love that album and, in the scope of 18 visions albums, if you look at the album before that obsession, it just feels like a natural progression of yeah. song songwriting. And I don't think we ever really intentionally went out of our way to do this or that when it came to writing music, uh, each album just sounds different because we didn't want to put the same album out twice. Yeah. And you know, those were risks and, and uh, that we were willing to take and, and challenges that we, you know, brought upon ourselves to, you know, challenges, challenge ourselves as songwriters and, and as a band. And, you know, you, 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 uh, you're a band for so long and you've got this identity of this like heavy metal core band, but then, you know, somebody starts bringing some different songs to the table, you know, during another, um, you know, writing session for an album. And you're like, Hey, I, I really, 
I really, really like this. And then somebody is like, Hey, I can do that stuff too. And you know, those types of songs just start compiling and, and, you know, you, you come out with a different album than the last and sometimes very different for us. Yeah. Um, you know, but we were, we were okay with it. And, you know, I think, um, as, as far as as far as the band goes like yeah maybe that album kind of did us in but i think a lot of it had to do with the way that it was handled by the label yeah yeah i mean you, you are right like if you listen to you know you go from vanity to obsession you can see you can see the progression there you can see that that's where you were going and then if you look at obsession to the self-titled you can definitely see that but i think kind of like what what doesn't help is like you know sometimes the metal community can be very hard-headed and, absolutely and especially like you know i think it was around the the divinity era where you, you know people started coining you as like a, a fashion core band and stuff like that and it's just kind of like why why is like why is appearance such a a big thing and why is why is it just kind of like oh it's this or nothing you know do you know what i mean if, yeah just how pig-headed yeah. the community can be sometimes with all the, the yeah i people. and uh, it's you know I, I was probably there once when I was uh you know a young 15 16 year old like hardcore kid yeah and you know denouncing all of my you know rock bands I grew up with or like Metallica even because it just wasn't heavy enough anymore yeah it was it just didn't have the edge it wasn't cool to me um you know obviously I came to my senses yeah. uh, but eventually uh, but yeah, I mean, for me, it's never had to, like whether or not I like a band. It's never had to do with image. It's it's always about it's always about the product, right? It's yeah. always about what, what what I'm listening to, what's going into my ears, and you know whether whether I like it or not. Um, you know, a band might put out one album I absolutely love, and they might put out an, an album right after that that sounds very similar to the one they just did, and I'm not as into it because I want something. I want something different. I want you know, I, I don't want to listen to, you know, the, the, I don't want to listen to the first release again yeah. in, a, in a different setting, right? Yeah. Where it's like kind of just like regurgitated riffs and vocal ideas and lyrics. And, you know, I want something fresh. I want something a little bit different. I want, you know, I want to know that the musicians and, and writers have like challenged themselves and, you know, work to put out like a different product. I don't want the same album over and over and over again. That's what will that's what'll lose me nowadays, you know, versus, yeah. you know, some people are just like, yeah, I don't like the way that band looks anymore. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, I just think it's such a, such a weird thing to get like fashion core. Like, you know, you have, you have all, you know, yeah. obviously some of them like joke John was like, you've got like crab core, which was, which was one thing and all that. And you know, yeah. Like, yeah. what, what kind of like, what did you feel about being coined fashion core at the time? Like people kind of, you know, saying you're kind of like substance, like style over substance and stuff like that. It's just very yeah simple. i mean yeah we didn't yeah we didn't really like it um to be honest with you we felt like music and uh, a genre or subgenre should have nothing to do with the physical appearance that yeah. I, it just it just never made sense to me uh classifying a band based on on the way they look you yeah. know then you know is is, is my chem a fashion core band you yeah. know right really? like but then you look at like bands like Slipknot and Image is everything. Like a hundred percent. Yeah. And, and Kiss and, yep. and, and all those kind of bands yep. as well. So Yep. Yep. So yeah, I mean that's that just I mean that hammers home a great point. So yeah, I, I mean, I don't know. It was something we never we were never really into. We tried to distance ourselves from it. Um unfortunately it's just kind of, you know, a stigma that stuck with us for a while. Yeah. Yeah. Well I think it kind of happened with a few bands at the time, didn't it? I think so like I think Avenged Sevenfold again at the time as well, and then you had like yeah, I think yep, I think around the, I think it started kind of like dying out when Bring Me the Horizon started coming on the scene, and they were kind of called fashion core and stuff as well at the same time. But, okay, yeah, yeah see, <laughs> hey, I don't, I don't, I don't even know how far it stretched and and yeah. like what other what other bands were classified, and maybe from Autumn to Ashes. I, I yeah. don't, I don't know. Yeah, I think it kind of started dying down towards the end of the two thousands, but it's just it was very strange. I, I thought it was strange anyway. <laughs> yeah. Um. And, you know, talking about that kind of era of the band, the, the, the vanity era, and you, you kind of mentioned it earlier that you repressed it. Um, how do you feel about that record? Like, I think it's like maybe two decades old now. I think it's 2002 that came out. Um, 
And why do you think like fans gravitate to that album so much in your in your discography? Yeah, I, I think it's super cool. Um, I listen to it now and I wish I can go back and tell myself like, hey, you don't need to sing over every single part, <laughs> especially especially when the songs are five minutes long. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just like, yeah, you know, because, you know, we, you know, we go through the catalog and we, and we pick and choose which songs we like and which songs we want to play live. And there's just some stuff on Vanity where I'm just like, I, I can't believe I tried to sing that stuff live back then. <laughs> no, yeah. I, I, I would, I would, I feel like I would have more success with it now just because I, I know my voice better and my body and, yeah. you know, I've gone, I've gone through training over the years. Um, but yeah, just, I, 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 I would have changed a lot about the way that I approached writing that album. Yeah. And, and obviously if I can go back and re-record the whole thing now, I would, yeah. I guess we probably could. It's just time consuming. And is yeah. it, you know, is it really, is it really worth it? We did the, we did the re-recording of the two songs and I was, yeah. you know, super happy with the way that those came out. Um, but yeah, I, I love that album. It's super important for us. It, uh, you know, it represents a musical shift for us and, you know, really kind of push the envelope uh, musically as well and, and really helped shape the band that we ended up becoming. Yeah. And you, you say you, you record those two songs. Um, so was there like talks to re-record the whole album potentially? Or like I say, was it just like time constraints that kind of put that? Yeah, you know, I think I think more or less because again we did the we did those two songs ourselves too. Those are the first two Keith Keith did. Right. And I think I think it was more like, hey, let's focus on the new material now. Yeah. You know, let's you know we could go through this and re re record all of it, but you know it's going to take a while. Let's focus on on new music. That's what we're really excited about, right? Is yeah. is something something new and fresh. Yeah. Were, that, were they recorded in the same sessions as Inferno or are they completely different sessions that you did all them in? Uh, yeah, they're different. Um, but, uh, well, I guess they're, they're around the same time period, you know, we re-recorded Vanity and You Broke Like Glass right around the same time that we were right. like writing and recording the first couple of songs for Inferno. So there's, there's a little bit of crossover there. Yeah, cool. Um, well, I guess, um, you know, it's, it's you know, near the end of the year and there's not much kind of going on, but is there anything planned for Racing Visions for the rest of 2020 or 2021 so far? I mean, I mean on ice at the moment. I, I think everything is just, I think everything is just kind of wait and see right now. Right. You know, what do we have control over as a band? And it is, it's, it's writing and recording music and releasing music and putting out physical product, whether that's, you know, doing a repress of Inferno or, you know, another vanity repress or, you know, pressing, you know, obsession or even like yesterday's time killed. Uh, some stuff that never saw a vinyl pressing before would be really, really fun yeah. um, for us. And I, I know the fans would really, really dig it. So those are the types of things that we actually have control over, right? So I would look more at doing those things. Once, you know, once we get some clearance to actually play some shows, I think, you know, we would act absolutely, I'll, I'll fucking play anywhere right now. Really? Yeah. <laughs> you know, oh, you, my garden. That's so yeah, yeah. Yeah. Hey, you book a gig in your garden and you cover the flights and the hotels and we're there in a second, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, I'm just, so, I'm so ready to play. We actually haven't played a show since 2018. Wow. That's, and, that's a long time. And we had eight gigs in the pipeline. Um, right when this all hit and we were the we the week that covid kind of like really really uh impacted the united states those those eight shows were being confirmed that week right. uh, four on the four on the east coast four in california and it just kind of all got washed and we had some really really cool ideas for those shows too uh hopefully we can end up getting back around to the to uh to that idea at some point yes um you know, but then we wanted to do around this time, we wanted to do Inferno release shows and yeah, it's just, yeah, it's, it's been a bummer, man, for a band that's, uh, that's part time that this is just really a hobby for us. Um, and 
you know, we do have to uh, schedule our, 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 our live gigs around Josh, our other guitar player. He plays in Stick to Your Guns. Yeah. And they've got like an intense tour schedule. So, you know, we're, we're working around what he's doing and finding, finding gaps in his schedule to book stuff for 18 Visions and, you know, knowing that we can't do that stuff. It's, it's, it's a bummer for sure. Yeah. But, I mean, what, what, can, what can we do about it, you know? Yeah, I mean, you, you can just do what the scientists are telling you to do, just right. follow the advice yeah. and just hope it goes away and, sooner rather than later. Yeah, and really everybody's in the same boat that plays live music, you know. And yep. like I said, like I said earlier, thankfully I don't do this for a living, so you know I'm not you know financially impacted by it. Yeah. So yeah, and like, like you say, like it's not just it's not just musicians as well. You know, you've got people that own the venues, you've got you know booking it's, agents, you've got producers who you know some you know some bands can't record stuff or anything like that. And oh yeah, yep. They're, yep. They're dealing with it as well, so it's just it's a dry it's, dry spell for everyone. Yeah. A dry, major drought um when, yeah. when, do you, when do you kind of think if you were predicting it what when do you think things are going to back to normal again man i don't i don't want to believe it but um and i didn't want to believe it so back in april one of my friends uh he so he manages our band along with like every time i die circus survive so he's pretty connected in the yeah. in the industry and he sent something into our group chat um uh that's I don't remember, I don't remember where the article came from, but basically like live concerts are pretty much dead until the fall of 2021. I mean, and I just like, I, I just laughed it off. Yeah. I said, there's, there's no way, there's absolutely no way that's going to happen. Like, you know, this, this, a, this thing's not going to go on for that long. B like, you know, people are going to want to play shows and, you know, fa like fans are going to want to go to shows. Yeah. And now that we're, you know, I know that's a year out from now, but I feel like that is a very realistic, um, a very realistic like time frame of yes. you know fall of 2021, at least for touring, right? And and like uh, every country is going to be different. Like I said earlier, like over here in the states, each state is governed differently and has its different like set of of, of laws and the way that they're following like. CDC guidelines and handling COVID and everything, you know, if we want to go down to Florida and play right now, we could probably play you yeah. know, a, a show in Florida. I don't know how many people they would let in. It would probably have to be an open air outdoor festival type thing. But, you know, I, I think some States will start to slowly open up to that. But as far as touring goes over here, I can't really see a band routing a tour around like five to 10 states. It's gotta be, you know, it's gotta be like New York and LA and Chicago and these big markets that are, are open uh, yeah. for, I think a lot of touring to make sense for yeah. bands. Yeah. I think one of the scary things as well, like, and you know, it's, it's not good to think about, but you know, we know of a few different coronaviruses that exist and not one of them have we made a vaccine for, but the kind of like oh. that we're going to get one for this. It's just, I mean, hopefully they do, and hopefully it's it's very soon. But it's just bleak to think about, isn't it? Really? Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's it is bleak. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm not I'm not scared at this point. You know, I'm not really like fearful of it. I, I don't want to get it. Um, yeah. I know people that have had it. Uh, you know, so for for myself, all all I can do is um, just be cautious. Yeah. You know, go go about living my life the way I normally would, but be cautious. Yeah. Have you guys considered doing like, I know a few bands do like live stream shows. Have you guys considered doing something like that or is that not? Really you know, we, yeah, we have discussed it. Um, early on, it was something we were interested in. And then after I feel like a couple of months into COVID, it was like, Hey, yeah, no, that sounds stupid. Let's not do it. And the deeper and deeper we get into this, um, the more and more it's starting to make sense for us to do, you know, yeah. and, and I've always been on board with it for the main reason just because we don't we don't we don't tour like i said yeah. like you know we will go and play four shows in a weekend and uh fly back home and call it a day and then yeah. maybe go out you know a couple weeks later or a month later but it's not this ongoing consistent thing for us and getting over to europe or australia those are you know, those present different challenges for us because to make sense financially, you've got to play, you know, more shows and there's, you know, a date of travel there and a day to travel back and days of recovery and acclimation to time zone changes and yeah. whatnot. So, you know, there's just, there's different challenges. So I've always been into the idea that 
you know, a random fan in Iowa or Nebraska or Switzerland or someone in, you know, Russia or, you know, Australia, New Zealand, people that would, you know, never get the chance to see us or have never had the chance to see us, you know, get to see and experience at least some form of, of what a live 18 vision show might be. Yeah. You know, and I mean, you, you remove the fans from the setting. So obviously it's, it's a little different. Uh, you know, you need to create, you know, and manufacture the energy yourself, which, you know, in, in a, in a club setting, a live show, normally you draw off the crowd. Right. And yeah. it's just this, this give and take of what you're giving the crowd and what they're taking from you and then what they're giving to you in return and what you're taking from them. And you lose that. So what can we do to make a live stream interesting and look appealing and sound great? Right. Yeah. So those are the types of things right now that we're, we're discussing. Yeah. And I think obviously with this type thing happening, it's going to be, even when COVID's gone, I think it's, it's going to stay around. And you think about yeah. financially, you know, if you guys want to come and do a show here in the UK, you've got to pay for those plane tickets and all that kind of stuff. Whereas you can do a live stream. There's no kind of cap to how many people can attend. So you can get, you know, you can kind of like budget the money from the, the, the tickets to attend that live stream and, and all that kind of stuff. So I think financially, especially for, for bands, you know, like you, like part time or, you know, just, you know, the smaller bands that are just kind of getting their, their feet up the ladder. I think it's like a viable option financially. And, and yeah, no, yeah, definitely is for me. I'm, I mean, I would rather go to the UK. I would rather go over there and, and do three or four shows. Uh, hell, I, I would even do one show, uh, yeah. you know, just a, just a London gig. And I would, I would be happy and I would know it would be a killer show and, you know, get to do a little bit of sightseeing uh, in one of my favorite cities. And, you know, the, yeah. those, those things are exciting to me. Those, those are things I, I can make happen. We just need to make, we, we need like, you know, all fronts make sense for everybody in the band, um, you know, time wise and, and financially so that we're not, you know, paying out of pocket to do, yeah. you know, some of these gigs. Yeah. yeah, definitely agree. Um, and I know you, you, you're busy and I don't want to keep you for much longer. So are there any final words you want to wrap up things with? Um, yeah, just check out the new EP. Um, super excited about it. It's some of the heaviest and darkest stuff we've done uh, in over 20 years. Um, we had a great time making it. And I think that I even felt more freedom doing this than the big comeback record in 2017, which was, you know, re refreshing. And even though, you know, for, for me vocally, it's not as like dynamic as some other stuff that I've done. Um, it was probably the most fun to do.